and thanks for joining us online. My name is Colleen Kennedy and I am the Executive Director of the Canadian Club of Toronto. It's great to have you here. Today, in honour of the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, we have gathered a dynamic panel of guests who will discuss what a greener Toronto and Canada looks like and how we can continue to build on current progress being made. These are challenging times. We've been forced to change the way we live and work. With that in mind, we think it's important to remain engaged with the important issues of the day. That's what our club has been doing so well season after season, over 123 years to be certain. And while we can't meet in person for the moment, I'm so pleased that we are able to meet virtually. Dialogue and discourse will not be a casualty of this pandemic. That's why we quickly adapted the way we bring speakers to you. We're delighted that so many of you have joined us online and we appreciate your interest. Today, we are connected virtually, but it is important to recognize the land on which the club sits and where many of us live and work. We are gathered on the territory of the Mississaugas of New Credit, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat. These lands are historically governed by the Treaty of the Dish with One Spoon, a treaty between these indigenous nations that solidified their commitment to share this territory and to protect the land and water. Today on Earth Day, it is especially important that we take a moment to think about how we can honor the treaty spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. While we recognize the contributions of the peoples that have come before us and thank them for taking care of the land and the water so that we can gather here today. We are mindful of our responsibility to carry forward those efforts so that the land and water can continue to be enjoyed for many generations to follow. Before we dive in to today's topic, here's some key information about how to participate with us. The click here to switch stream button helps if you find that your internet is slow. The video quality may decrease, but the audio quality should remain strong. Once you click the questions tab, you can enter your question into the window and it will come to us. We will try to get to as many questions as we can today. The request help button located in the top right corner is there for technical support as needed. We are pleased to host today's event thanks to the generous support of EY. We couldn't do it without our sponsors. One of the Canada's cl the cl club's traditions has not changed is the toast we make to our nation. Usually done in person with the raising of a glass. If you can, please rejoin with me. If not, make a nod towards the screen and toast Canada. To Canada. To Canada. 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 It's time to introduce our panelists. Thomas Mulcair is the visiting professor, Department of Political Science, University <clears throat> de Montreal, and chair of the board for Earth Day Canada. Christine Gabardo is the co-founder and director of techno technology for CERT, a University of Toronto-based startup. Jennifer McKelvey is the Toronto City Councillor representing Ward 25, Scarborough Rouge Park. Chris, and Christine Rhodes is the Central Canada Market Leader for Climate Change and Sustainability Services at EY. And last but not least, today's an excellent moderator, Dr. Dan Riskin, scientist, author, and former host of Discovery Channel's Daily Planet. We're so glad you're all joining this. And with that, Dan, I'll turn the Canadian Club podium over to you. Thank you. This is my first virtual podium, so I'm, I'm thrilled about that, and I'm excited to get rolling. I want to start by putting Earth Day in the context of what's going on here, this COVID-19 time. I mean, it feels like we're in a shutdown, and to use the computer term of thinking of a shutdown, we are going to restart. And so there's a question about what that restart looks like, and I think the restart has the potential to be extremely positive. And what I mean by that is that we get stuck in these routines, just like a computer does when it's been on for too long. We know that we just drive to work every day. We know that we always fly to that conference. There are things we do without thinking that we've had a chance to rethink. And so there's a very big question about how we go forward. And there's a real opportunity for us to take this perturbation, this, this getting knocked off our bicycles and getting back on and trying to figure out how to move forward in a new and better way. 
Um, so today on the 50th uh, Earth Day, I want to lead this conversation about a positive way forward. I want to harness the intellectual momentum that a lot of us have built in our homes. I want to build that momentum in this conversation. And I want to figure out how we can carry this to a better future as participants in this conversation. And by the way, as you have questions, uh, please just fire away. They're coming to me on a separate screen. If you see me looking away, that's what, uh, what I'm looking at. And I want to integrate those questions throughout the hour. I'm not waiting till the end. So please fire away with questions as you have them. Now, uh, the way forward uh, for Canada in, uh, with, in conservation and uh, the future uh, requires contributions from local government, from nonprofits, the tech sector, and corporations. And our panel includes representatives of all of these. And that's why I'm excited to get started. So I'm going to do that now. And I'm going to start with Mr. Mulcair. Uh, so you're the chair of Earth Day. Uh, maybe you can begin by telling us a little bit about what your organization does and, and just giving us some context for how that all began. Where does Earth Day come from? Thank you, Dan. And thank you, uh, Colleen. And many thanks to the Canadian Club for this really excellent opportunity to speak to so many people on this important day. As uh, Dan mentioned, it's the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. So let's take a look at that. What brought people together 50 years ago? Well, there had been several events starting in the 60s with the publication of uh, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. People started to be very much aware of the effects we were having on the world around us and how that was affecting, in particular, our health and ecosystems. In the late 60s, a couple of things that people could understand by seeing them took place. There was first and foremost a fire that took place on a river called the Cuyahoga in Ohio. And people were able to say, well, okay, this is clearly a serious problem. And then there was, of course, the tragic oil spill in Santa Barbara. That was the critical moment. American politicians of all stripes got together and said, we've got to start doing something. They created the first Earth Day, and millions and millions of Americans, and soon people around the world on April 22nd, would get together with their resolve to do something. Now, what's interesting today, and Dan alluded to it, with COVID-19, of course, what's happening is that it's a real threat that you cannot see we're having to base ourselves on the science. So if we were able to come to grips with the problems in our physical environment that we could see and decode and react to through that 50 year periods from 1970 to today, now we're really having to work very hard to get people to understand that they have to act on something that they can't see, which is greenhouse gases. That is the number one problem still facing the planet today. And maybe that's one of the things that are positive that will come out of this terrible health tragedy that we're going through right now. There is hope, but as we come out of this, there will be serious economic problems and a strong pressure back, using old arguments against any move to better protect the environment, as if the environment were a cost that we could no longer afford as we rebuild the economy. That's why it's so important that we work together to understand that there's no contradiction between protecting the environment and building an economy for future generations. That's a great point. I think that's uh, something that's come up in the conversation about COVID is that early on, it was this either or do we bring the economy back or do we deal with this disease? And how soon can we just stop dealing with the disease and bring the economy back? And, and it seems that Canada, uh, not every government, but certainly in Canada, the, the consensus has become we don't do these independently, they have to be part of the same solution. So do you see that kind of a cognitive shift happening for environmental questions? It's going to have to happen for environmental questions. <laughs> we've been working so hard, we've gotten it right, largely. But again, there has been some backsliding in the United States. We'd never have anticipated a government that would actively seek to destroy the environmental protections that had been there for 50 years, and yet that's what the current administration is doing. But they're also the ones who say that there is an invisible threat with regard to health. And maybe we'll be able to dovetail on that and get people to understand that there is a serious risk out there, one that they can't see like a burning river, one that they can't feel like the oil on the birds that are being cleaned in Santa, Santa Barbara, but one that's very real. What we've been doing to the planet is dangerous for life on the planet and for future generations. I do think that we're going to be able to do it, but it's going to take a lot of work. And the people in this conference are just an indication of how many people care about that. Absolutely. So, uh, Dr. Christine Gabardo, I want to talk to you because you deal with the invisible every day. You're an engineer who's trying to find a solution to this CO2 problem. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about what your startup does? Uh, let's not get too sciencey, although, I, of course, I would love that. But uh, let's let's just in broad strokes. What is it your startup is trying to do and how does that fit into the solution to all these problems that we're facing? Sure, no problem. Um, so thank you to the organizers for inviting me here today. Um, 
I guess I completely agree with Mr. Mulcair. The threat of uh, CO2 emissions and greenhouse gases is an invisible threat, and there's many parallels to the current COVID so, um, situation that uh, we can definitely learn from. So um, our company, CERT, um, is focused on using uh, this invisible threat, carbon dioxide, as a feedstock to create other chemicals and uh, fuels that can be uh, integrated directly into our existing economies. So our technology takes carbon dioxide and uses it as a building block um, powered by renewable electricity. And we form other chemicals like ethylene, which is a commodity chemical, and ethanol, which is a liquid fuel. And we're able to um, avoid the emissions that would be typically um, produced through conventional means of producing these chemicals. And we actually consume um, CO2 in the process. And uh, we believe that not only our uh, solution, but other carbon utilization solutions will fit um, directly into um, creating a sustainable economy for Canada. Um, there is no silver bullet that will solve um, clim the climate crisis. It will take concerted effort, and uh, many technolo technological solutions will need to be um, supported and, and um, implemented in order to overcome this climate crisis. Yeah, you know, I, I just this morning I was talking on CTV about uh, this idea that during this COVID-19 pandemic, things have gotten slightly better for the earth. There's been less pollution. Uh, the skies are clear over a lot of big cities that normally have a lot of pollution. But I, I want to know what your experience has been as someone who is trying to use the infrastructure of a working society to fix this problem. Uh, you know, there's been a shutdown. You've lost uh, the ability to use your lab, to have this, the students at University of Toronto that work in your lab uh, can't be there right now. So what, what has COVID-19 done to the momentum you have as a startup trying to fix this problem? Yeah, so it's definitely been a challenge. Um, I think late last year, um, we saw tremendous momentum and traction in the climate um, community um, with the UN Climate Summit and the cl climate strikes that were led by Greta Thunberg. And um, that really was propelling everyone towards a more sustainable future. And then COVID hit, and it's really disrupted everyone's way of life. And I just hope that um, after this is all over, we can realize that the climate is still in crisis, and we need to um, still preserve um, it. So by still directing our efforts towards um, developing these technological solutions, um, we are maintaining our focus during this time. Many um, carbon utilization companies have actually pivoted towards making um, products that can help during COVID-19. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, some are making carbon-based materials that could be used in uh, filters. Some are making hand sanitizer. So I think it's really a time that um, our company, as well as other um, small companies, can use this as, a, as an opportunity to innovate and come up with unique solutions that will benefit us not only now, but also in the future. Right. It remains to be seen whether people sort of uh, focus on the health side and say, let's throw everything else away and just focus on health and, and disease, or whether a, a more global perspective of let's listen to experts uh, and see what they have to say about what the threats are. Uh, it, those are two different sort of possible routes that society is going to take out of this. And uh, of course, it really matters uh, which of those which of those happen. Uh, so, uh, Dr. McKelvey, now you have uh, worked as a, as a uh, environmental geoscientist. You have a Ph.D. in that. You've been on the science side. You've looked at the big picture because that's what these scientists do. But now you're working in local government. So what made you decide that that was an effective strategy to tackling climate change and other environmental problems? Well, firstly, I just want to thank Canadian Club for this great opportunity to be here today and wish you all a happy 50th Earth Day. And for 20 years, I did work in research and specifically looking at remediation of oil and gas contamination, as well as trying to solve some of the issues around nuclear waste. And after spending 20 years working on these solutions for cleanup, it just really got me to thinking of how can we have better environmental policy? And how can we make some big systematic changes in the way we're doing things so that we're not leaving these problems of legacy and waste 
for the next generation. And that's something that really compelled me to, to cross over and hang up that lab coat and those field boots and uh, start to wear a suit to work every day in heels. But I think something that really compelled me with municipal government is that 25, more than 25 years ago, I guess, now uh, I attended the first flag day earth raising of the earth flag at the Scarborough Civic Center. And it was my first real exposure to municipal politics. And seeing that really we can tackle a lot of these issues locally. And at the city of Toronto, uh, we're very proud that we've declared the climate change emergency and that we are working towards being net zero by 2050. But we're also joining a global movement of more than 800 municipalities in 16 countries that are also declaring that climate change emergency. And that's really important because we're seeing federal and provincial governments time and time again fail on climate change action. And that's because they're really trying to deal with a very broad range of stakeholders and issues. And the needs in one province to the other or from one city to the other are very different. Um, but by working at the municipal level, you can really made, tailor make that, that climate change policy to fit, uh, to fit the needs. And I think really, um, I, I, Mayor Garcetti, I think, said it best. So at the C40 conference uh, last fall, he got on stage and he said, even if the White House is out, we're in. And I think that's the power of municipalities right now to make change. You know, I think there's a study that just showed up uh, in Canada yesterday about COVID that showed that people tend to trust their family doctor more than they trust people higher up the chain. And when you get up to city or province or even federal, there's sort of a, a disconnect that happens. People, when, when crisis happens, people think locally. And so I wonder if maybe part of the problem for the lack of traction on climate change for a lot of governments has been perhaps that they've been, it's been the big governments that have been trying to do something. So do you think that, that local government can play a big enough role to tackle this? Absolutely. I think local governments have to play that leading role in tackling it. And part of that is that at the municipalities, we have a really important role in demonstrating uptake of technology. And specifically, I think the city of Toronto being Canada's largest municipality, we have a role to be leaders and to demonstrate what's possible. And we're taking that responsibility seriously. So we've now purchased 60 electric buses from three different manufacturers, and we're comparing their suitability in the cold Canadian winters. And that's information that can be shared with other municipalities. Likewise, last year, we, we put solar panels and Tesla power packs onto a Toronto paramedic station. And that's important because residents can walk by and see solar panels. It's tangible. They can see them. Uh, they, can, they can hear the experiences from the people that work in that building that they've had 30% reduction in their power consumption by having those, uh, those power walls and having those solar panels. And so I think that's why it's really important for us locally is that residents can see those changes and then they'll be more likely to make them themselves. And I will take one quick um, plug for two things that we have coming forward that I think is gonna even further show that to residents. Uh, in my community later this fall, we're gonna have a micro transit project and it's gonna be a fully electric automated vehicle that people will be able to ride from their houses over to a transit hub, a major transit hub. And so that's, that's a very visual example and it will give people a lot of level of comfort that you know, electric vehicles can get them to where they need to go. And the other one I think is, is exciting is later this year, we'll be opening uh, the city of Toronto's first fully net zero building. And it's gonna be an 18,000 square foot childcare center. And so again, when people are going in and out of that building, then they can see what's possible and they'll be more likely to start to make those changes in their own home. No, that's great. Yeah, and you feel like you're part of the solution when you take advantage of those things that are available in your community. Um, all right, Christine Rhodes, uh, now you're working in the, the corporate sector, and this has been uh, not a very fun time for most of the corporate sector uh, with COVID-19. People have had to adapt very, very quickly. A lot of businesses are struggling in a real way, and even the big ones uh, have had to really do some quick uh, turning on a, on a dime. So, uh, how do you think that the lessons from what's happened in the last two months are going to translate to the challenge of climate change? Or do you think that they're just very different and that there may not be a connect there? No, I mean, I think I, I agree with uh, some of my fellow panelists here. There's a lot of a lot of lessons learned that um, 
that we should all make sure to be concentrating on as, as we move forward into the recovery period and, uh, and, and forward from that. So certainly um, some of the just tangible, obvious uh, examples of, uh, you know, all realizing that it might not be as critical as we used to think it was to, to be there in person, to have everyone fly in from across the country to, to have some of those meetings, um, you know, we're able to kind of work in different ways and, and be as effective as, as we can be. I think that's important. Um, and another exciting piece, I think, is the is the potential for innovation. Um, so, we, you know, we've had this situation thrust upon us, uh, all of us as individual citizens and as, you know, members of our respective employment groups, um, and the amount of uh, innovation and, and sort of pivoting that I've seen just in the past four to five weeks of companies, you know, changing their entire, um, you know, manufacturing lines or, you know, breaking everything down in terms of how they operate a mine site or, um, or an oil and gas field uh, or how they deliver services in, in the public as a, as a retailer or, or a bank. Um, you, you really see the power of, of the corporate sector uh, when, when um, we experience issues like this and the ability to, to t harness that energy and, and um, take that same momentum. Cl climate change is a bit of a different beast because it's, as we've said, something you can't really see. And it's also something that happens over sort of a longer period of time. So there's not that immediate need to react. So somehow I think we need to, to bridge that gap to be able to, to um, harness some of that same momentum to, to a challenge that, you know, ha has a bit of a different time horizon on it. Right. So, so businesses are going to need to harness the momentum. Uh, Tom, I want to come back to you and ask you individuals uh, who want to harness momentum, who want to make a change, who want to turn over a leaf and just make this change happen now enough waiting let's go what and this is a question by the way that's coming from multiple people who are watching right now and who have taken the time to type this out thank you for your questions keep them coming so what are we supposed to do to harness mo this momentum what are some of the things that people can do well of course this earth day has its challenges as we've all pointed out the confinement puts a lot of restrictions on what we can do together but at the same time if you go on to the website of earthday.ca jour de la terre.ca you'll see lots of suggestions for what you could be doing at home right now. You can be planting your seedlings and getting those ready for your garden. You can, as soon as that's possible, and already in many provinces it is, you can get a, a seedling and you can go out and plant a small tree. You can actually do things in your home. You can make sure, for, for example, for the future, you only buy locally. Buy things as they come into the stores from local pro producers. That's good for your local economy, but it's also good for the environment, not to be buying things that are being shipped in from thousands of kilometers away. I think that that's the type of thing, actually, Dan, that might be changing. A lot of people are gonna realize that the daily commute isn't essential. And I think that there might be some very positive changes to our way of life. I rhymed that off before Earth Day and Jules de la Terre. It's worth pointing out that this is the first time that Earth Day Canada and Jules de la Terre have come together as one organization last summer, we managed to bring the two together to merge them. And so now this group is working in unison across the country and that's quite an accomplishment. I wanna go back to something that Christine Rhodes was saying before and it's important. One of the things I love about Earth Day as an organization is that it is very action oriented and results oriented. We work a lot with the private sector, with grocery stores like IGA Sobeys, for example, and we give courses to, to families, but we also teach people who run grocery stores how to avoid waste. We teach families how to better manage their food. Those are, again, very concrete things that do play out in the environment as well. And it makes people conscious that they can play a role. Even though it is important that individuals understand that they can play a role and it's crucial, it's important also to understand that the other orders of government, municipal, provincial, and federal, have to be doing their share. I was there in Paris uh, for the climate conference in 2015. I was thrilled at the promise uh, that was being made on Canada's behalf. But I think we have to be honest with ourselves and look at the numbers and realize that since then we really haven't delivered. So it's easy to point fingers at others, but we've, we've got to start with uh, the one in the mirror and, and make sure that, that we are indeed a model for, for future generations' right to live in a clean environment. Hmm. Yeah, thank you. Those are those are some great points. And, and I will bring it back to Christine Rhodes uh, to ask you, there's a question that's come in uh, citing a McLean's Magazine article addressed uh, 
ending economic growth as a way to reduce environmental damage. And I think this goes back to this idea that uh, prosperity is at, is at odds with saving the environment. So how do you, how do you think about in, in the environment in the context of economic growth and GDP? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a it's a great point and something that you know I'm, I'm always glad for the question to be asked so that we can we can address this outright. Um, you know, the reality is uh, the work that our companies are doing every day, both small and large, uh, in Canada and around the world, are the engine of, of our economy. It's it's the way we um, get food. It's the way we live. It's the way we you know move around to visit family and friends and um, and and you know achieve success in our lives. So you know, that their activity is critical. Um, but ultimately, companies are not going to be able to continue to do the work that they're doing and generate the economic return that they're generating without uh, an earth and, and a society that is that is prepared and, and able to support those, those functions. So the you know, we're already seeing the the impact of a, a changing climate today and in some of the uh, changing weather patterns. Um, and unfortunately, the the speed or, or lack thereof of our mitigation activities is going to continue to propel us um, in a direction where those impacts will be, in fact, worse and worse. So um, the the, nece the necessity for business to um, to make some of the investments today, both in mitigating, so reducing their greenhouse gas emissions, and also starting to adapt, thinking about some of these changes and um, making some uh, adjustments themselves in, in how they do business. Um, Though those are critical steps and, and need to happen um, because ultimately we'll, we'll reach a point of no return. Um, and it won't be a choice between economic growth and, and environmental protection. We actually won't have either. Right. Uh, yeah, they, they, they must fit together. Um, so right now uh, I'm talking to you and you don't hear any screaming children because my wife was kind enough to take them outside for this hour so that I wouldn't have any interruptions. Uh, we're all sort of dealing with uh, being cooped up in our houses. Uh, and what they're doing outside right now is they've gone to pick up some trash. They've gone to to spend some time out on Earth Day and to think about what uh, they can do in the in the community to make things better. And so I want to I want to come to Jen now uh, as a as a counselor. How are people using green spaces in Toronto right now? How are we allowed to use green spaces right now? Because I know there's there's some discussion of us all getting in trouble if we stop walking. We're allowed to go through a park but not stop in the park to do anything like sit on a bench. Um, but green space is uh, is part of mental health. I mean, we need these green spaces. And so how are people using them now? And what effect do you think that's gonna have on how people go forward from this, what they take from it? Well, in the city of Toronto right now, any amenities are closed. So any playgrounds, benches, any touchable surfaces, so to speak, are off limits. But what is permitted is people to walk, cycle, or run. And that's because it's recognized that it's extremely important to get exercise for your mental and physical well-being. And so we didn't get it right initially. Uh, initially, we had overcrowding in some parks. Uh, we ended up shutting parking lots. Instead, we're trying to encourage people, instead of looking at parks as recreation destinations, um, walk locally, walk to somewhere in your neighborhood and watch for physical distancing, watch the number of people that are out there, um, plan your route accordingly, plan to come home if you need to. Um, I will say that for my part, I do run still right now. I'll try to run early morning. I love running in the rain. Uh, you don't have to worry about bumping into other people. So we do need to be strategic about our green space use right now. But I think the big lesson that we have coming out of this is that we certainly could benefit from more usable green space in the city of Toronto. And we did release our ravine strategy in our 10-year implementation plan on that, that's looking to build, um, in particular, two big projects. One is an 81-kilometer loop trail that connects different ravine systems. And the other is one that would go from the Don Valley out to the Rouge Park, and that's that meadow way through the hydro. So I think this really kind of underscores how important it is for us to move forward on those plans. Our green spaces we recognize are really important green infrastructure. They protect us from flooding. They filter our water. They give, uh, actually they put a value on it, $822 million of ecosystem services. So any investment in those spaces has a huge return on investment. But I think now we've really also seen that they also have an important role in preparing us for more mental and physical resilience in the face of things like pandemics. Mm. 
Yeah. Uh, so, Christine Gabardo, uh, I want to ask you a question as an engineer, as a scientist. Uh, there's this meme going around on the internet that every crisis movie starts with a scientist who's being ignored, right? <laughs> and it, that's right now being shared in the context of a pandemic because, uh, you know, there are all these epidemiologists who have been saying, stop, you shouldn't be eating wild animals in a market. Let's not do that. Uh, by the way, we're all too close together. We don't have we don't have the right things in place. And now we're all realizing what happens when you don't listen. And we're, we're trying to react as quickly as possible. With climate change, if that ignoring happens until the exponential function starts and things start running away, we can't all just go and hide in our houses and wait for this one to end because it's it's preventable. If we wait long enough, it's not reversible. And so as a scientist, what do you think the, the key has to be in terms of taking the momentum that epidemiologists have built to getting people's attention? And how do we as scientists take that uh, momentum and use it to keep the ear of the public? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think it's really important that uh, we as scientists and engineers learn how to communicate to the public. Um, COVID and climate, um, they're all really complex topics and we have a hard time distilling down the information to what is needed. And there's also conflicting um, news that gets out there because of how complex the topics are. So I think one of the learning, key learnings that we can take from COVID is that um, it's important to come up with terms, actionable terms um, that the public can identify with. So flattening the curve, Social distancing, these were, these were all terms that were um, developed just for COVID. And I think similar terms need to be developed for uh, the climate crisis and um, directives for uh, the world at large to follow that, that are easy to understand and digest. Um, I think that we need to kind of take this and use it as a cautionary tale. I don't think anyone wants to be in quarantine again. And I think... And like you mentioned, quarantine isn't going to help us when the whole climate collapses. So um, I think it's it's definitely something that we need to use to scare, not scare people, but encourage people to look further into the future and how our actions now really do impact everyone, everyone's lives, the environment, everyone. So um, yeah, so I think communication is really the key there. Yeah, and that's what we're doing right now, isn't it? So uh, in, in the spirit of that, that communication, Tom, I want to go to a question uh, that, that someone's written in here about incorporating the costs of CO2 emission into healthcare. Uh, there's a there's a, uh, a study out of Stanford. It's more of a back-of-the-envelope calculation, but roughly 9 million people die every year around the world because of air pollution. They die earlier than they would otherwise. And if you look at China and you look at the reduction in emissions that happened over about a month and a half while they were dealing with the COVID crisis, you know, they lost a certain number of people to uh, COVID-19, but about 2,600, I believe. But the number of people that presumably were saved by that lack of pollution is about 50 times higher. Uh, and so nobody wants to have a pandemic to save lives with reduced air pollution. That's not the model going forward. But it, it does bring to question how we think about the costs of the environment and what we're willing to live with in the name of economic growth. So uh, I guess the question for you is, is there a way for us to start talking about CO2 and talking about pollution in a way that people understand the way they've come to understand COVID? No, I think that that's absolutely essential, Dan. Those are basic principles of sustainable development. Internalization of the cost of the pollution, polluter pay, user pay, basic principles, but we don't apply them enough. And it should also be a consideration when we're setting up our system of tariffs and what has to be paid when you're importing something from another country. It's one thing to say that we're in a world now where competition is from country to country being leveled by these big international trade deals. But if you're dealing with a country that's making aluminum by burning bunker oil, and every ton of that aluminum contains many times more greenhouse gases because of the way the electricity was made to produce it than it is in Canada, that's not a level playing field. And you should be allowed to take that into account when you are importing from a country like that. And these are rules that are going to have to take place if we ever want to come to grips with this. Otherwise, we're just going to keep doing what we've been doing in the past, which is exporting our pollution. 
So if we come up with rules that make it more difficult to have highly polluting businesses here, but we can go and have that done in other countries that don't have those rules, we're, we're cheating the system and we're fooling ourselves. So we have to come to a full understanding of the application of these rules. There was a, a French uh, prime minister a few years back, Dominique de Villepin, who actually proposed that at the UN. At the time, the Kyoto Accord was in place, and he said, we've got to be able to start taxing the countries that are anti-Kyoto. Well, there are still countries today that are fighting against the Paris Accord or doing anything about it, and we've got to find a way of internalizing those costs and making sure that those polluters pay for it. There are smart proposals out there, very clever one from uh, two former U.S. politicians, in fact, uh, Baker and Schultz, who have put together a very interesting proposal that has very specific ideas on the issue that you just raised, Ed. Uh, the next question that's come in from uh, from outside here is uh, for, from one of our uh, audience members is that uh, one of the biggest differences between climate change and COVID, in their opinion, seems to be that the response to COVID has been pretty apolitical, at least in Canada, uh, compared to, say, the United States. And so there's a question about how we can make the environment a little less political. And I want to I want to send this question not to somebody who deals with politics. I want to send it to Christine Rhodes. I want to know, as someone who's not, uh, you know, thinking about political uh, alignments, who's not uh, involved in that, uh, as, as a person working in the corporate world, how do we take the politics out of these kinds of conversations? Because right now, it seems like as soon as you say carbon tax, people say, whoop, liberal, whoop, NDP, whoop. You know, they've got, they've got these hats that they immediately jump to. Yeah, yeah, it's it, it's a challenging question. I mean, I, I'm a little protected from that, thankfully, in my sort of corporate boardrooms uh, sometimes. Um, and and what I think has been um, a, a trend, uh, or not a, not a trend, but it's sort of an evolution over the past couple of years. Um, and, and over those two years, by the way, we, we've seen an incredible uh, uptake of the appreciation for the impacts of climate change within the corporate boardroom space. Um, and so, in a way, there's a variety of drivers for that. But I think you know one of the reasons is 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 um, you know uh, many influencers and um, and international bodies are now starting to to really talk about climate change in terms of the potential impact on business. So you know it's it's not really about um, you know a choice or or belief that you make about the science. It's about recognizing uh, the facts and uh, understanding and projecting how those facts might impact uh, the way that you run your business today or, or into the future. The, um, you know, we, we, talk about, we talk about climate sort of in, in broader terms and we, and we talk about some of the changes to weather patterns and things like that. And I agree with, with Christine Garbato, we, we need to find ways to, to translate these into um, just continued clear messages about what some of those impacts are so that people um, can relate to that and, and say, okay, so th now I understand how myself sitting in my condo building in downtown Toronto might be impacted over the next, you know, 5, 10, 20 years because the, um, you know, the facts are, are, are quite scary. This isn't about, you know, a couple of extra floods or a couple of, more, you know, more intense snowstorms. Um, you know, we're, we're really looking at global shifts in, you know, migration patterns, um, you know, the ability for, for uh, crop yields to, to maintain their, their necessary levels to, to feed our populations, um, you know, that can lead to all sorts of not just physical environmental issues, but, but societal issues. Um, and, and, and those are the sorts of facts that I think we do need to um, make, make clear. Yeah, that's a that's a great answer. And, and Christine Gabardo, I want to ask you as as a scientist working on this problem. I mean, I, a lot of the people I know who are who work in wildlife, for example, or who are biologists that do field work, they're so depressed about a lot of this, and it's so overwhelming. My wife teaches environmental studies at the University of Toronto, and she has a hard time with just delivering all this bad news and saying, you know, we've got to do something, and feeling overwhelmed. What do you do? To, to stay hopeful when you see all those facts, because it does feel sometimes like it's just too much cognitively for a human to take to, to even look at. Right, it is, it is a lot. And I think the, the important thing is to keep focused and to know that this is a challenge that is facing the entire world and we as individuals can make a difference. So um, 
our company, CERT, is one of the finalists in the Carbon X Prize competition, which is focused on developing key technologies to convert carbon dioxide into useful products. And um, we are demonstrating a pilot plant of our technology right now in Calgary, Alberta at the ACCTC as part of the finals of the competition, along with four other teams, uh, two of which are other Canadian teams. So I think seeing um, the progress of all of the teams getting to the point where we're demonstrating these technologies that were non-existent just a few years ago and getting to the point where they can be scaled to a pilot plant and operate and demonstrate it is really encouraging. And I think that's what really propels me forward um, and that gives me hope for the future. That's great. Yeah. And and Jen, you're, I mean, you worked as a scientist, now you're switched to, to local government. So I, I'm sure that uh, is motivated in part, and you can, you can tell me if this is true. I, I imagine it's motivated in part by trying to, wanting to make a difference and trying to figure out how to make a difference most effectively. Um, is, is that, do you feel like that's the way forward is for people to get their hands on the ground? Well, we all have a role to play. And for my part, I think bringing that lens of, of science um, can be useful and have a different perspective. And we always need a range of perspectives at the table to discuss a problem because that's how we come to ultimately come to the best decision. And I think part of that, the shift that we're starting to see and where we need to go on this is really recognizing that people are part of the environment. And we tend to discuss people and the environment separately. And I think that's where we tend to fail. If we want to have broad groups um, collectively rally around action, then we need to show the human side of it a little bit better. And through this pandemic, we've seen that certain socioeconomic groups are going to be harder hit by this. And those are also the same groups that are also going to struggle more under climate change. And so we need to start to think about resilience in a broad, as a broad lens. And how can we be more resilient to impacts that we'll be facing in the future in these uncertainties? whether it be climate change, pandemics, uh, population growth and rising inequality, uh, we need to see how we can tackle those different groups. So I'll give you a good example. If you look at climate change, uh, the impacts will be felt differently uh, across the city. So when I grew up in an apartment building in, on the Scarborough North York border, uh, it was hot in the summer. And this was you know, 30 plus years ago. And so we have all these towers in Toronto that don't have air conditioning. And under climate change, uh, you'll see that there's going to be even more heat waves and it's going to be even harder. And so on hot nights, we used to sleep on the balcony and that's not a solution. We need to retrofit those buildings. And that serves multiple purposes. Uh, it decreases energy consumption, which is good for the environment. It's better for people's health because it's not good to live in extended heat. Um, and it also is those same groups that are going to be struggling the most right now during COVID as well, because that's where we have uh, the people that are working in the service industry, for example, that are facing unemployment. So I think we need to, to use this uh, pandemic to look at making sure all groups are, um, are treated uh, equitably and that there's something looking at resilience coming out of this for everyone. Uh, yeah, and as individuals, there are things we can do in, in whatever uh, role we play in society, whether it's through our jobs or through our volunteer efforts or just in our families. Um, I have a great question here from someone who I asked you this. You're, you're a leader. Uh, all of you are leaders, but Tom had the title. Uh, and so the, the question is, what can uh, people do to be effective leaders for change? How do people uh, build momentum in the communities around them? Oh, that's the place to start, I believe, is in the communities around them. Uh, Jennifer McElvey just gave us some great examples of the municipal order of governments playing a crucial role. And you can get involved in a community group, and that's the beauty of uh, the world today. It's quite easy to find a group in your neighborhood where you can produce a direct result, and those results accumulate and they create a, a critical mass. You know, municipalities do play a crucial role. And this year on Earth Day, we're talking about that a great deal because we realize that leaving everything up to the federal and provincial governments hasn't produced the result. And when what you're doing doesn't work, Try something else. And so we're going to be putting a lot of emphasis on collaborating. In fact, Jennifer and I will be on a call this afternoon with the federal minister uh, who's now responsible for uh, for patrimoine, uh, uh, Stephen Gilbo, who will be there with the mayor of Montreal, Valerie Pont, and a couple of others, talking about that very issue, the, the, the role and the importance of municipalities. And by the way, it is always connected to health. Montreal's done a pretty darn good job on mitigation, which is fighting to reduce greenhouse gases, but there's been a bit of a mitigation 
bias. Uh, on the adaptation side, uh, Montreal's fallen short. So back in 2018, when we had that horrible heat wave, uh, in, in Toronto, there was one death related to that heat wave. In Montreal, there were closer to 100. It's because we had not done the preparations and hmm. retrofitting, as Jen just said, retrofitting uh, seniors' residences to make sure that they had the air conditioning. So these are things that are forward-looking that we have to do to protect ourselves and protect our health. And that's another thing that will come out of this horrible health tragedy that's the coronavirus uh, crisis that we're going through is that a lot of people are going to say, well, we've got to be better prepared. And so since we know that heat waves are part of global climate change and there's something that we have to be preparing for, it's going to, in fact, I believe, be easier for local governments to play that role. So having that type of backing from people at the community level pushing to make sure that those governments are achieving that result will make it even more certain that we will be able to do just that. So it's leading in your community and it's nudging people who are also the, the, the leaders in the, in the community as well. Uh, Christine Gabardo, I, I want to ask you, one thing that's come up uh, on Earth Day is the question that, you know, despite this shutdown that's happened and everybody locked in their houses, the impact on the environment, while substantial, if you do the math, hasn't been enough that for us to hit the targets that we need to hit by 2030. And I think a lot of people feel overwhelmed by that. Well, if this isn't enough, how on God's green earth am I possibly going to meet these climate goals? Are they completely unsustainable? And, and part of the answer has to be that the things we're doing now aren't sustainable, and there are sustainable things that we can do that can have a bigger impact. Can you talk, I mean, you're working directly in CO2 recapture, but can you talk a little bit about the kinds of changes that we can expect to, uh, to live through and whether those are going to feel like what we're in right now, or if it's going to be more positive, or if it's going to be a sacrifice, what kind of a future do you envision as a sustainable future? So I think um, on the individual level, there will be a lot of changes in terms of um, our travel and how we work. So I think we've all learned that Zoom conferences are an effective way to have meetings. And I think a lot of workplaces will transition to um using this as a platform to um, hold meetings rather than sending somebody across the world for a day uh, to meet with a client. So there's the individual changes, but there's also infrastructure changes. So I think like we've seen that um, our reliance on oil and gas has um, led us to be vulnerable during this uh, time of crisis. And I think that investing in energy infrastructure like renewables and um, energy efficient retrofits that will help us maintain our economic um, sustainability as well as our environmental sustainability. It will create jobs um, for Canada um, while implementing these new technologies. And then there's also, so that will reduce our CO2 emissions in the sense that we won't be burning fossil fuels as much to uh, create energy, but we've already put a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere. Um, there, we still need to get rid of that somehow. And I think um, a lot of the carbon capture technologies and sequestration, so pumping them into reservoirs um, underground or utilizing it in a way that we do, um, these technologies will need to become more prevalent and um, investments into uh, these through stimulus packages um, will be crucial into ma making sure that Canada has a stable and sustainable future. If people who are watching this want to get behind those kinds of initiatives, those tech startups that are trying to find a solution, uh, it's one thing to, to cross your fingers and hope the governments will fund them, but are, are there ways for people to contribute or to support your initiatives? So I think there's a lot of um, Toronto startup communities. Um, many of the, the members of the communities right now are struggling due to um, inability to access funds um, through the federal programs, although there was a recent um, program announced uh, through IRAP, um, which will help um, those that aren't able to access the sub sorry, the wage subsidy um, uh, because they are pre-revenue. Um, so there are those programs, and I think um, really looking at the, the companies in the community of Toronto and supporting them um, through these programs is really important to help um, our startups grow. Uh, Christine uh, Rhodes, 
the point was made about uh, uh, about investing in the future. And one of the things that happened after the 2008 uh, financial crisis is that uh, the environment then actually had a, a little bit of a reprieve uh, while the economy slowed, but then it came back with a vengeance and it overshot where it had, it had been before. Uh, how do we avoid that mistake this time? Yeah, I mean the the uh, the interruption of uh, COVID uh, on sort of our oops, excuse me <laughs> our economic growth patterns is um, is obviously something that we weren't anticipating the um, the sustain change that we have to make to how we do business and how we live our lives as, as yourself and Christine Grabato were saying that that's really the focus so certainly um, whatever we uh, whatever the governments choose to do in terms of economic stimulus if we can tie some of that money to our climate goals that's a great way to uh, to sort of inject in in a, in a short term or, or sort of more concentrated fashion some of those investment dollars that, that are requested so I, I would absolutely we look forward to um, to any news that uh, that any level of government is, is planning to do um, fo focus on that in, in the recovery period. Um, the uh, the important thing I think in terms of in terms of thinking about this is that these are investment dollars. This isn't just sort of a, a spending of money and then it sort of disappears. Um, we're, we're comparing um, these the dollars involved in in mitigating and adapting. Adap adapting to climate change, um, to, to the costs ultimately that will result if we don't do those actions. Um, but, but the money we spend today is, is an investment. And when you, when you innovate the way that you um, create energy or the way that you do business or the way that you transport goods across the country, um, you know, that's, that's a positive change for our economy going forward. So we need to kind of keep that mindset um, as we think about sort of the, the dollars that are gonna be, that are gonna be spent. That's great. Uh, I, I want, we don't have a lot of time left, so I want to give each of you the opportunity to sort of give a final thought. Uh, and I want you to, to think about a, a concrete message you would give to the people who are watching this right now. Um, how do people reset in this post-lockdown world? Eventually, we're going to come out from our hobbit holes. We're going to enter, you know, we're going to go to a coffee shop again. We're going to go out for dinner. We're going to uh, and, and for some people, it's more dramatic. So, you know, we're going to find a job again, and we're going to be part of this economy. So what message on this Earth Day, this 50th Earth Day, do you want to send to people to think about, to give them that little spring in their step as they head out? Maybe, Jennifer, I'll start with you and ask you what your message would be to the people in this audience. Well, thank you. And I'm going to repeat something that I heard on a call this morning talking about how the world has changed and we need to look at climate change post-COVID. And uh, Tanya Sermon of CSI said that Mother Nature has sent us to our rooms to think about what we've done. And I think that's a, a really profound comment that she made. And we're doing a lot of thinking about that right now. And I think uh, Thomas hit on some very important points about how our behavior is going to change post-COVID. Uh, will we look at consumerism differently? Will we buy locally? Uh, will we think about those purchases more carefully and just buy things that we love as opposed to being a throwaway society? Uh, are we also gonna keep some of the, the things like working from home and commuting less and some of those good behaviors that we've adopted during COVID? Will we keep that going? Another one that we should think about too is food and the way we look at food. In the city of Toronto, we're being encouraged to shop just once a week. And we're thinking about food a little more carefully. And I think a lot of people can attest they have more food waste in their homes because they're looking at how those leftovers can be worked into the next meal. And we're, we're being more careful and pragmatic about that. So I think there's a lot of behaviors we need to look at how we can keep that momentum going. And in the city of Toronto, we are releasing our strategy for being net zero by 2050 and later this fall. And today we started a really important conversation on this panel, and we'll be continuing that at five o'clock with the wonderful Earth Day event that Thomas is organizing. So I look forward to that continued conversation. But one thing I do want to put a plug in for and share with you all is that we had hoped Earth Day would be a little bit differently. We all had big plans to be outside, to be cleaning up. And in the city, we were looking to launch our involvement in Women for Climate. And we still are hoping to do that, but it is delayed. It's a, a wonderful networking and mentorship opportunity for young women that's connecting them with more than 500 women globally. And 13 cities have signed on, and one of them is Montreal. And so it's great that we'll be speaking with Valerie Plant at five o'clock as well on Thomas's panel. 
And I do want all the women out there that are watching to please watch for that and participate and apply to the program. We need all ideas at the table and we need everyone to participate. And we know that globally, uh, women will be affected disproportionately by climate change because that gender equality persists. And so we're hopeful that we'll have Toronto women joining this global movement. So please watch for that on the City of Toronto social feeds as well as mine. That's great. Thank you so much. Uh, Christine Rhodes, what are your final thoughts? Well, I think, uh, you know, to your question about what, uh, what do we want our audience to take away, um, the, the thing that inspires me, I think, about uh, what we've all been going through uh, over the past five weeks is is just the realization that you know we really can all work together on these massive global problems that, that face us. Nobody was expecting, well, the scientists were expecting this. I think your average citizen probably was not. Um, but uh, you know, we 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 as individuals and we as Canadian organizations have been able to adapt and in a really admirable and fantastic way and, and come together for the the greater good of our of our country and our planet. So um, I'd like us to to remember that feeling. Um, you know, the, the feeling of working together through these sorts of hardships. Uh, and, and as we face uh, greater challenges going forward, climate change being a, an important one, um, let's let's draw on those uh, successes. Great. Christine Gabardo? I would like to um, echo Christine Rhodes' statement and Jennifer's statement. Um, this is really our time to think about how we got to this situation and uh, take the lessons learned from COVID and apply them to climate change. This is our time to be proactive instead of reactive. And I hope that we come out of this as a Canadian so society that wants to really invest in our sustainable future and really take those actions um, and put them into place. Great. Thank you so much. And Tom, go ahead. Well, thanks, Dan. And once again, thanks to the Canadian Club for bringing this together. It's been refreshing to have so many strong voices expressing the views of what we've done right over the past 50 years, but what remains to be done. So I guess that would be my parting thought. Where do we want to be 50 years from now? Right now, we're learning a lot of empathy. We're seeing some tragedies, like in a lot of seniors' homes in Ontario, and especially in Quebec, uh, right across the country. Uh, people are being hit so hard. But that crisis gives us a chance to focus on exactly where we want to be as a society. That empathy, going through all of that pain and difficulty right now, gives us a chance to hit reset and say, okay, what do we want to leave as a society for our children and grandchildren? And so to, to put it uh, that way, I think we could say, don't waste this crisis. Learn something proper from it. We do have a lot of good people, a lot of information. We know the types of things, we've mentioned a lot of them today, that have to be done to change the economy for the better, to make it sustainable, to make things long-term. In 2008, we went through a big economic scare. They don't seem to have learned a whole heck of a lot from it. This time, it's not only the economic scare, it's a massive health pandemic. It is bringing us back to basics, concentrating on our own priorities, getting back to the, the, the elements that are the best in our society, our the people we're closest to, the people we care about, our friends, our families, and using that as building blocks locally, nationally, to come away from this in a better place. Those are all great, great thoughts. I think uh, as moderator, I've, I've really enjoyed this conversation. And I think in the, the context of what's possible, I feel very optimistic. I think Canada has had an opportunity here that uh, I don't remember seeing in my lifetime and might harken back to perhaps the world wars in terms of a, a unified effort against an enemy and the uh, solidifying of our identity. And Canada has handled this in a very Canadian way. And I'm super proud of what I've seen. I'm super impressed by the response uh, of all the governments that I've, I've seen taking scientific information and acting on it appropriately. And what that's done is it's really showed me that it's possible. In the past, there was a pessimist in me that said nothing could ever work. Every, you know, people are too entrenched in what they they care about. But Canada has shown that in a time of crisis, we can step up. And so, 
uh, I'm, I'm left with optimism. I, I thank all the panelists for their contributions. I thank uh, the Canadian Club of Toronto for making this happen. I thank the people watching at home for your excellent questions, which have really driven a lot of this conversation. And I hope that uh, we can take this opportunity to feel not like we've been hiding in a hole waiting for something to go by, that maybe we've been in a cocoon. You know, we've been a bunch of caterpillars. We've been doing our own thing and we're going to come out of our cocoons and we're going to have renewed, we're going to have new powers. We're going to fly. I don't know what that means yet, but we're going to do something new. There's a real possibility here. And, uh, and I hope that people feel inspired to do that. So thank you for your time. And I'll, I'll pass it back to Colleen Kennedy. Thank you so much, Dan. I, I look forward to figuring out my new superpowers. I think you're right. We have so much positive to build on and this panel thank you so much for doing a superb job of helping us understand the challenges and opportunities dan your moderation is superb thank you for guiding uh the great great conversation all of your expertise and willingness to participate in this format is so appreciated and i thank everyone for celebrating earth day with us and helping with this important conversation so thank you all panel and dan we're also thankful that today's event sponsor ey we hope you can, uh, we wouldn't be able to do it without you. And tomorrow we have a new, uh, another event at noon tomorrow. Uh, we hope you can join us. It's on the state of the innovation agenda. And I know that Christine uh, talked about some of the issues that startups and innovation, um, new innovation companies are facing. So we're going to talk about how they're faring and where investments are going and what recovery might look like for the innovation economy. So we hope you all might be able to join us tomorrow. We'd like to thank our AV supplier, Van Valkenburg Communications and liveevents.ca for making it possible for us to come together virtually today. And guests, thank you all for joining us, sending your great questions. Please stay healthy and safe and happy Earth Day, everyone. Thank you. Happy Earth Day. Happy Earth Day. Happy Earth Day. Happy Earth Day. Happy Earth Day.